tune on key there. It's a kind of text or something. Anyway, uh, shaved yesterday, which is nice. Get rid of all the little bugs and food and stuff that was living in there. Um, right, give me a second. Let's find out who's in the workshop this morning. Yes, and we had technical problems. I don't think you saw that because I still got live on time. But YouTube has changed the live stream function. It's all different now, so bit of a bit of a panic station, a bit of stress, but we got there in the end. Okay, scroll down. Let's see if YouTube's caught up. It oh, there's two streams. That's wonderful. Okay, well we'll have that one. I think that's the one we're in. Bom 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 bom. Yes, Simon says morning, Andy and crew. Good morning, Simon. Welcome back, good sir. Uh, we've also got the real Daz. Morning, Andy and crew. Exactly. Cut and paste. Good morning, Daz. Right. Let's see what else is going on. Boom, boom, boom. Cool. Skip the adverts. And is the audio and the visual any good? Because uh, we'd be moving around the old internet beacony thing that's on the side of the workshop because we're doing the, well, we're doing some more of the roof now. More on that shortly. And well, it's sort of not pointing in quite the right direction anymore. I did. I did take a bearing on the compass on my phone, but then realized that it gives off magnetic field. Yes. So when I came to reset it, it, I knew it was pointing completely the wrong direction. So I had to just sort of, you know, eyeball it each time. Should have turned it off first, shouldn't I? Yes. What a numpty. Anyway, not to worry. I'm not a Vodafone engineer, you know. And it sort of still works. Once we've finished doing the roof, and well, the roof is, okay, let me explain. The roof above the workshop is finished and it's brilliant. It's so much cooler in here. Uh, and when it rains, it's a lot, a lot quieter. And the rain stays on the outside of the building, which is even better. And Ben came down a couple of weeks ago and he said, hey, I'm bringing all the workshop gear home again. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. Uh, no problem. We'll make it work. But everything we have is chocker. All the sheds, they're all full to the gunnels. So we're going to have to have a bit of a tidy up. That was stage one. We did that whilst Ben was here. And we had to move uh, a silver shed, which is adjacent to my workshop at the far end, just on the other side of the window. And that took a bit of doing. It was Full of stuff, cleared it all out, took a load of stuff down for tip, uh, took a lot of stuff out of Ben's shed to make some space, and then managed to get everything in Ben's shed, pretty much. He has stacked quite a bit on the roof of this workshop in the in the void, um, but it's still up, and the beams were built for additional uh, capacity, a bit of redundancy built into the design, so, well, let's say we're just putting this to the test at the moment. And uh, Now, once that silver shed was gone, Ben said, right, the plan of attack is we need to extend the roof that you've built above your workshop and you're going to build me a shed at, at the end of your workshop, which is just on the other side of the wall uh, behind the big air compressor that's on the bench. So I said, well, that's quite a good idea, son, actually. Let's do that. So we, we so moved the shed and the silver shed dug out all the concrete, semi-leveled the site, planned our attack, and that's as far as we got. Uh, well, we actually we put up, I think, four bits of timber, four little stubby bits for some more beams, because we did we did make that bit longer. This is pure pure luck. We made it a little bit longer. The, set the big posts, the vertical posts, further back, and uh, now that's given him some space for a shed. So uh, yesterday, me and Mrs. Mechanic, we made a couple more big beams. We have to extend them, so they're about eight eight point two meters long is the span uh so we extended two of those made all that up that's dead done they're going to get installed this morning and then we made a lot of brackets yesterday afternoon because we couldn't go outside it was pouring out of rain uh made some more brackets for the bits that go along the roof that the corrugated iron screws down to i always purlins purlin thanks jim in my head um on the purlins so we've then got to extend the purlins uh, out and then once Ben's shed's all built and there's a lot of work still to do but at least it was the start was done for us um he then wants a carport further up adjacent to his shed with a nice concrete pad so that he can work on things outside on a nice sunny day but in the shade and the dry 
because he quite likes car ports. He's come to realize that car ports are really good, you know, and side ports and house ports because our garden is disappearing really quickly. And honestly, if you took a satellite picture, there's a huge amount more roofing than there used to be a few years ago. But anyway, we're getting there slowly but surely. So recording videos at the moment is, it's just impossible at the moment. Uh, I've got a few lined up. I've got all my bits and pieces and stuff for the videos ready, but I really haven't had time because Ben dropped this bombshell of having to build another shed. And the carport, the, Ben's car, Ben's port, we'll call it, Ben's port will happen a little bit further down the line. That's not critical. What he does need is a secure area for all his workshop gear. We probably won't get the floor concreted to start off with. We'll just get all his gear in there, make sure it's secure and dry, and he'll be a happy lad. And we've got to get that done by the end of April. So we haven't got long. If we get it concreted, that's a bonus, but we'll, we'll wait and see. I'd like to get it all done in one hit. Uh, so I'm pretty knackered at the moment, and tomorrow morning, I have to drive up to Auckland and fly down to Queenstown, and I'm down there until Thursday when I fly back. So I'll be away from home, which isn't the end of the world. It's part of my job, it's what I do, but it means that I can't pick up the tin, the roofing for Ben's workshop. So it's not gonna get a roof put on it until the weekend after, maybe. We'll see, we'll see how things pan out. It's all about logistics, because it involves the big trailer, because uh, the lengths of roofing are 7.5. Yes, that's right, 7.5. Because I know it doesn't stack up, right? The beams are 8.2, but there's an overhang on that side that doesn't get roofing put on it. Because that's going to be cut and bolted to the beams on the side port. And then the side port beam will then have the roofing on. So don't panic, my sums are right. It just sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? Yes. Right. Who else have we got? Uh, Simon, good in the UK. Excellent. Purple Monkey 974. All good at the moment. Excellent. Uh, Connor K. Hey, morning, Connor. Uh, Connor K. Morning, Andy and crew. A and V is... I like that. A and V is good. Perfect. Richard Perry. Hi, Andy and crew. I'm early for once. GB, thumbs up. I was very nearly late this morning because I'd set the live stream up about quarter past eight. Uh, and as you can see, there's two thumbnails. So, you know, I'll have to delete one of them. And uh, went in to get a coffee, came back out, and it had gone off. It wasn't there anymore. So I think YouTube, the my phone, must have updated after I'd set the live stream. And it just disappeared from, from what I could see. Uh, so I had to do a whole new one. But the whole, <laughs> the whole format... Of, of the layout of how you do the live stream it completely changed from what it was like 10 minutes earlier. It's like, how does this work? Anyway, I bumbled my way through and we sort of got there. Had to do it a couple of times and then it seemed to work. So my apologies. Uh, on the next live stream in a couple of weeks, if it doesn't happen, you'll know why. Anyway. The Giants. Good evening, Andy and crew. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Watching from South Africa. Good morning, the Giants, and welcome back. Hang on a minute. We've got some stuff going on. Oh, no. It's children. We'll leave them alone. Right. Um, my God. Madivus. Madivus. Madarius. Madarius. International. Hey, guys. My eyesight's terrible this morning. Nope, that's not a word. Hey guys, clap, clap. Very good, sir. Simon, hang on. I've got to scroll down. I've got a heart in the way. Uh, oh no, that doesn't work. Uh, used to know an old trike builder. He had not, he had not, he had not garden to, he had no garden. The full backyard was a mass of sheds and carports all linked together. See, I like that. Bit of a maze, a few little sneaky corners, corridors. Tunnel will be good. I like tunnels. That's probably, once we get all the Ben stuff done, uh, oh, and incidentally, the silver shed that we moved, we, I was going to scrap it, to be fair. The Mrs. Mechanic went, oh, that'll be a nice garden shed. Okay. So Ben then built, used some of my timber, thanks, Ben. Sorry, had to do. 
Uh, but it, to be fair, he used, he used the bench space, that's all right. Uh, he then built a frame inside the shed, cross beams and all sorts, did a great job actually, uh, with a pallet screwed to it on the underside, um, because obviously it had no floor, because the concrete floor was smashed up. And, and then Trevor the tractor amazingly lifted the entire shed in one go and took it off down the garden. So it's now down the garden and it's waiting to be relocated. And we're going to build a wooden floor uh, on some little legs. So it all stays nice and dry with a little ramp. So Mrs. Mechanic can keep her lawnmower and other garden implements other than Trevor the Tractor. Because um, Trevor the Tractor officially is a garden implement uh, in that shed. And it's quite big. She'll have plenty of room in there for stuff. So she's over the moon. Um, it used to have like 10 slidey doors, which were crap. So I'm going to build a wooden frame on it and make some nice wooden doors for her. Um, but other than that, it's still quite functional. It didn't get too damaged on the move. Um, yeah, it actually was a win. It was a major win. I couldn't believe that little Trevor picked that thing up. But I suppose it looks a lot bigger than what it weighs. Right? I mean, it can't weigh any more than about 350 kgs. He didn't lift it very high off the ground. So it probably was overweight because it's supposed to be able to lift 350 to full height. And it was only about a foot off the ground and we ran out of hydraulic pressure. So... You know, did the trick though. Ben was very impressed. Very, very impressed. Okay, where do we get to? Jim, uh, hey, morning, Jim. Right, Jim, before I read your comments, I have some news. Um, Got to phrase this in a way that nobody else understands. Abort mission. Um, the delivery time. Uh, according to um, the person that needs the part, the delivery time is pretty much identical to what we've been told it will now be when it's supplied through the normal channels. So don't go ahead. OK, um, thank you for checking it out. Uh, on this particular occasion, stand down, not needed. Uh, we're going to stick to the original plan. Make sense? Okay, uh, Jim K, Andy, glad to see the internet is working, but only just, it's only just working. It's not ideal. So, we have a pie. Now, Ben left this, he bought, it's a pack of three, okay, and it's just called Pies. Pies seems to be the brand, P-I-E-S. Uh, prime New Zealand beef, uh, no MSG, no anti preservatives, and no artificial colours. Okay, uh, oh, here we go. Look, created by Dad's Pies. So it's a Dad's Pie. Okay, 57. So Dad's Pies is located near Auckland and it's a sort of family run business used by the 29th of August 2024. So we're still going to be all right. Um, tells us a bit of nutritional information on the box there. Look. And they are individually wrapped, so uh, it's not a problem there. Oven, preheat, 160, 20, oh, 23 minutes. Sorry, 20 minutes. We do ours for 23 out of the fridge. Uh, air fryers. Hmm, okay. I don't have a lot of luck with air fryers, to be fair. Right. Uh, FAB. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so we're going in. Get rid of the cigarette because it's all gone. We're going into the box. Don't know, unboxing. People like unboxing videos, don't they? And it's a pie. I mean, you can't get any better, can you, really, to be fair? Okay. One pie. Get rid of the box for now. Hopefully the packaging's not compromised. Okay, so these go in a pack of three. It's not an individual pie. Oh, my word. Okay, I'm going to have to split the packaging. It's a bit tight on the packaging. Bear with me. Okay, so. The pie. Now, this is a steak and cheese, my favourite flavoured pie. And that's the view of the top, the base, and we'll do a perimeter check. Dum, 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 dum. Looks pretty solid, doesn't it? I don't see any cracks or uh, deformities at all. Looks absolutely as planned by the manufacturer. Okay, so let's go and have a wander and stick it in the pie warmer. There we go. Everything's moved again, honestly. Turn you around, three, two, one, boom! Okay, there we go. I oh, need crap. Not, not a lot of room on that chair. Okay, dum 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 dum. We're going in. Right. 
on pie in the very grubby pie warmer now, but it's, I think it adds flavor to be honest. Right, 23-ish minutes, hopefully the timer won't fail on us. Uh, good luck pie, do your best. Okay, so what's going on in the workshop today? Oh, well, uh, like I said, I've got those beams to put up. Uh, I've had a bit of a tidy up. Yes, I uh, remember there was a massive pile of wood screws and tech screws and stuff on the bench, which had no home because every drawer was full. So, uh, what did I do? I moved some of the, you remember the Myford lathe? I know, I know, I still got to get around to that sort of, Myford lathe bits have been demoted down to that cubby hole thing. Which, to be fair, I don't use. I only had a bit of pipe in it, so that's all right. And now we have a drawer full of screws. So I reboxed them, labelled them all up. Well, compacted the boxes. So there's more than the quantities that it says in the box. Just to drop the box size down to get as much in there as I can. But, unfortunately, I couldn't get all of it in. No, we've still got another drawer over here with tech screws. This is sort of the original tech screw drawer, uh, which has also got other stuff in there, which, you know. Maybe I should move that. It's only a shallow drawer. I won't get all that lot in there. No. And to be fair, this massive box here is for the roofing tin. So we're going to be using all those up when we do, well, we use some more up when we do Ben, the rest of Ben's roof uh, and, and the sides of Ben's shed. Actually, so one thing I didn't mention actually is, is uh, and I'll tell you around, three, two, one, boom. Um, we've decided in our infinite wisdom, normally when I build a shed, well, in the past, I've always used timber for the sides. Um, but unfortunately, here in New Zealand, the old weatherboarding is really expensive. And this is being built on a budget. Remember, it wasn't planned. It's sort of one of these knee-jerk reaction builds. Uh, we want to do the best job we can, and it needs to be watertight. You know, we don't want Ben's tools and stuff to go rusty and things. Um, so we've decided to put on the outside to put the same roofing tin on the sides other than the doors, I'm going to make some nice timber doors for him. Um, and then on the inside, which will be absolutely watertight, uh, the problem with using normal timber, I say just, just planks, is they dry out, and then we end up with huge gaps between the wood. Now that, it allows air to circulate through and stuff, and the, and the place would stay pretty dry, but when it rains really hard, it gets in. You know, and it's not ideal. So Ben says, no, no, I'd much rather have corrugated iron or, you know, traditionally we call that. So, so the, the tin sides. Um, and then on the inside of the shed, he'll then panel it all out with some plywood, which would be a great little project for him because he likes doing woodwork and stuff. Uh, so he can do all of that. He also needs to seal off the void between his workshop and, you know, and, and mine because we've got two roofs on my workshop now and there'll be a gap. So you could actually... You know, at the moment, you could clamber onto my workshop roof, which is open, uh, and then you could scrabble across and drop into his workshop. So he needs to block all of that off. So he's going to put a wall at this end. Um, maybe just on that void, or maybe, or, you know, full length. Probably full length, to be fair. It'd be a lot tidier. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes, you know. But I, we don't know yet. It's all, all down to cost. Cost and time, which affects a lot of our bills at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. So we're, we're just basically doing that, and I'm, I'm doing work stuff. God, my phone is so annoying. I, it just, I get so many notifications now. It's unbelievable. I should just turn it off, really. In fact, I'll put it on silence. Now I can't. I can't put it on because one of you guys might send me a picture or something, and I'll miss it. Um, let's see what we've got. Hang on, I've got to keep checking the phone now. I could do with Mrs. Mechanic just to monitor my phone. Could be dangerous though, couldn't it? Really. Right, okay, there we go. Nothing to report. Um, now then, what have we got? Uh, Pete Woodfine, hi Andy and crew. Good morning, Pete. Welcome back to the workshop, sir. Sorry I'm a bit knackered today. I've been knackered all week, to be fair. I don't know why. There was one day... I've been doing I've been doing dealer visits this last week, as well as lots of admin work. And I got home... I think it was Wednesday. Yes, the second visit that I did. I got home about... Three o'clock, it would have been. I just hit a wall. I was absolutely knackered. I mean, I still carried on, did some more. I'd been worked to like six o'clock, but I was just batteries were on like two percent. I was absolutely buggered that night and fell asleep watching TV very early in the evening. Unfortunately, didn't much much to Mrs. Mechanic's annoyance. Um, anyway, such is life. 
Uh, Pete, not everyone has hit the like button. Be nice and give it a like. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Simon, uh, seen a few sheds made with plywood and coated each year in old engine oil. Lasts for a good few years. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, it's pretty cheap. We used to use creosote uh, on my sheds that I had in, in England at Mum's house. Uh, horrible stuff to apply. Makes all your skin itch and everything. But that was my job. You know, go and creosote the sheds, that Andrew. Uh, you know, every year. Uh, Dad would come on with a massive great drum of creosote. Used to get your eyes stream and your skin itch. and God knows what was in it, but anyway. Um, but no, I think the tin idea should work pretty well. Uh, it's very reflective. It's very silver, is the steel, so it should reflect a lot of the heat. Um, I mean, it's going to get hot in there. It is. In the middle of summer, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be baking in there. But there's not a lot we can do about it. I mean, at least it's got a reasonably high roof at one end. At the other end, it's a little bit low, but he's going to put his bench at, the, at that point, so it shouldn't really cause a problem. He can work around that. And Ben is a little bit shorter than I am, so that helps. Um, and we've not even dug it out yet for the concrete, so we'll try and set the concrete as low as we can, but we'll have to build, uh, dig a trench until the carport's done. We'll have to dig a trench to make sure that there's no water runs in. Um, and then when we do the carport concrete pad, We'll put one of those grated full length drain things in. So if it does, if, if rain does come in, it'll, well, in actual fact, rain won't come in, will it? Because it's got a roof. So it'll all go across to one side. So it should be fine. Once the car, once the bend port's done, it should be fine. All these things to think about. I'm not a builder. You know, you've got to plan like 10 steps ahead before you even start. It's just ridiculous. So next weekend is Easter. Which is good, because next week is a short week, which is great. I like short weeks. Uh, so good Friday, or basically Friday coming. Ben's coming down in the morning. He's not going to come down Thursday night. He'll be, he'll be working all day. He'll, he'll be knackered. So he's going to come down Friday morning. Uh, so I can get a few bits and pieces done of my own stuff Friday morning. Uh, and then we're basically full ball with his shed. Now, we can't do the roofing, because like I said before, I can't pick it up. Uh, I'm away. Uh, but we can get all the vertical posts set. Uh, the two big posts are already in. We've got one more big post set, which is the other post for the doors. It'll be twin door, uh, traditional garage style. Uh, so you can get big stuff in there. Uh, you might even be able to get an RV in there, actually. If you if you wiggle it a little bit, you'll be able to drive one of those in. Um, so all the vertical posts, got to get all those concreted in. I think there's going to be five. So one, two, three... Yeah, I think there's five all up to set, which is probably about a day's work digging the holes and stuff. This is all you can use Trevor the Trap to dig the holes. No, it's right next to my workshop. I'm not doing that. I'll be not my workshop now. Um, we don't think there's any pipes in the ground up there, but you never know. This is the problem. So I'll Trevor the Trap to have to just have a little watch at the sidelines. Um, so that hopefully by the end of that weekend, we will have... All the posts done, all the timber work done, ready for the roof to go on. We'll have made the doors, we'll have hung the doors. It's going to be quite weird. It'll be a shed with doors, but no walls. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then the following week, I'll get off to get the steel work picked up, the, the tin. Get that picked up, and then me and Mr. Mechanic can make a start. We can get the roof done, and then, and then do the sides. Easy job. All the timber will be in place. And then once it's all dried out, you know, once it's all a dry room, so to speak, uh, then we'll... We'll let the ground dry out and we'll dig it all out because it's quite it's quite powdery soil up there, quite peaty. So we can dig all that out uh, and then work out the height of the floor. Although they're saying that the doors will dictate that. So yeah, here we go, you see, build a problem. Um, so maybe I can't make the doors yet, but anyway, not to worry. Give me a day off. Um, and then we can, you know, do the concreting. I'd like to get the concreting done before Ben starts filling it with stuff. Because otherwise, it's just going to be a palaver pulling it all back out again to do the concrete in. So, yes, he's just going to have to wait, basically. And if he has to store some of his gear in my workshop for a couple of weeks, so be it. You know, we'll make it work. Um, long term, I don't really know what my schedule is at the moment. I know what I need to get done. Um, but at the moment, there's a few changes going on with work uh, and how we do, our, do my visits to the dealers. Uh, and until that's uh, the new criteria is confirmed... And the new schedule, I've done a new schedule based on that until that's signed off. 
Uh, I can't really do much other than like one day visits. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a pain to be honest, but anyway, it's all right. We'll work around it. It'll cut, it'll get sorted out. Uh, what else? I don't know. Actually, I'm sort of running out of things to talk about at the moment. We've just been so busy doing that. Oh, I've still got the video to do on fitting the free running hubs to the chimney. They're over there in a box. That's one video. I've got two more winches down here to pull apart and see if we can get those fixed. So again, there'll be uh, another, or maybe two more winch videos diagnosing the problems with those two winches. Hopefully we can make one good one out of two. Uh, the problem we have here in New Zealand is we just can't get the parts to repair the winches. If a winch fails, whether it's a burnt out motor or rust corroded brushes, or even, even just worn out brushes, something as simple as a, you know, a set of worn out brushes, we can't go to Warn, the Warn distributor here in New Zealand, and say, hey mate, can you sell me a brush pack? Because they're like, no, we'll happily sell you a complete motor, but we're not selling you a brush pack. And unfortunately, the cost of the motor, a genuine motor, is about half the price of the winch. So it's not really worth doing. You know, you, everything else is already secondhand. So hence why I've got a workshop full of bits of winches at the moment. They're all tucked away. You know, you've seen it on previous videos where I've pulled the winch apart, we've identified the faults, but that winch, some of them, haven't been repaired because it's quite expensive and I don't need to do that. I've already got quite a few winches that do work, so I think there's two, two good ones down there. If we can get one of these two working, that'll be three good ones that are already in stock. Uh, we're going to use some on Larry the Carry, uh, but they're only four and a, I think, I think they're only four and a half thousand pound pull winches, so bit small for Larry the Carry, really. So Larry the Carry, it's going to be a first. Uh, the plan is Larry the Carry is going to get two winches on the front, not one. How cool is that? So, you know, worst case scenario, we can use both winches. I know you can double line a winch and that helps. I mean, Larry the Carry, he doesn't really weigh much more than an ROV and a lot of Companies put four and a half thousand pound poor winches on an ROV. Maybe one will be okay. Maybe I'll divert back to one, but two would be cool. And then one on the rear, you know, as a tether winch. That would be awesome. So we've got a few plans to do. That's where three of the winches are going to go. Um, I'm not going to put a four and a half thousand pound poor winch on the chimney. It, that is too small for the chimney. It needs an eight thousand pound winch. Um, but they're expensive. So I'm just just sort of waiting for the right time. Maybe one will come up second hand that's in good nick. Uh, although unfortunately many people tend to burn their winches out and overuse them. Did you know the duty cycle on a worn winch, an ATV or an ROV winch? This is quite an eye opener actually. I, I didn't realize until I read the owner's manual. Um, but if you're using the winch at full load, so you you know your vehicle's stuck in a bog, you're spooling in, the winch is working really hard, in fact, I'll put it out to you guys. Have a guess how long worn state in in seconds, there's a clue, how long you can use the winch for before you have to allow it to cool for 10 minutes. Okay, so how long in seconds can you use the winch under full load, so not stall, so it is actually spooling in, uh, under full load, the rating of the winch, so, you know, in this case, four and a half thousand pounds, how long can you use the winch for spooling in before you've got to stop to allow it to cool for 10 minutes? There, over to you. And remember, this is under full load, okay? Uh, Simon, 80 seconds. Pete Woodfine, 23 seconds. Purple Monkey, 95, I like that, 95 seconds. Keep the numbers coming, people, because you're way off. Keep them coming. This is actually quite fun, actually, because I know the answer. Because I did the reading. And no Googling. You're not allowed to Google. 45 seconds, Connor K. Keep going, crew, keep going. Uh, great fun. How many viewers have we got? 19 viewers at the moment and seven likes. Come on. Oh, 22 viewers now. 21 viewers. So seven likes. I'm pretty sure a few more of you actually like the live streams. So don't forget to click on the like button. And um, hey, 
you know, if any of you out there, and I, I know a lot of the viewers watch the live streams post live stream, if you know what I mean. Uh, if you want to support the Andy Mechanic channel, you can do that. Just want to wait for some numbers to come in. You can do that through Patreon, uh, or you can jump onto PayPal, andymechanic.co, uh, sorry, andymechanic at live.co.uk. Uh, there's a link in the description. Uh, jump onto there, onto the PayPal. That's my email. Send the DOS across. Don't do it as a donation. PayPal, about a year ago, changed the way that they operate with donations. And unless you're a registered charity, you can't accept a donation. It has to just be a payment. So you've got to do it as a payment. Um, if it's not a financial support you want to, you want to offer, uh, and, and many have over the years, and for those that have, thank you very much. It really has helped. Uh, and, you know, the odd bit does dribble in now and again. It's not something that I rely on, um, but it is very helpful because it goes towards projects and building roofs and making the workshop a better place for filming and stuff, which it's so much better now. You know, we don't even hear because the sun's out now, we don't hear the roof creaking as it expands anymore. That's the difference it's made. It's absolutely amazing uh, having that second skin roof on there. It's brilliant, it really is brilliant. Uh, and I wish I'd done it ages ago. Uh, but what you can do, uh, and I see reports every week come through from YouTube, is for you to share a particular video on the channel on your social media. Uh, to help spread the word and that gets us a few more subscribers and a few more views and it really helps because at the moment I think we're now at 91,000 almost 91,500 I think it is uh, subscribers obviously when we get to the magic 100,000 you know that will be awesome it will it's taken a long time but we are still getting there and it this last few weeks the subscribers have you know the, the subscribe subscriber count has increased quite a bit uh, getting a lot more every day now than we did a couple of months ago, which is really nice to see. Uh, despite me not really posting any videos, which is quite ironic. Maybe I should stop posting videos altogether and we'll hit 100,000 a lot quicker, but who knows? Um, I like doing the videos and I'm looking forward to getting behind the camera again, you know, and, and editing up the videos. Uh, I did edit one. Oh, the last one I edited was the Workstation 4. I'm pleased that project's now in the can and it's all done and out of the way. I've got a clean slate. And, uh, you know, we can crack on and, and get some repair videos done, get back on the tools, so to speak. Okay, I think the numbers have run out. So, Connor K, crap, is it going to be much less seconds duty cycle? Uh, that's bad. Yes. Okay, I think we've stalled out on that one. Um, so, a small worn winch designed for ATV and ROV application. If you read the owner's manual owner's handbook there's a little table in there and it, it basically shows you how long you can use the winch for based on load uh, so under maximum load in this case four and a half thousand pounds or it's a three and a half thousand pound winch three and a half thousand pounds you can use the winch for drum roll 10 seconds yes 10 seconds use 10 minutes to wait and then you can have another 10 seconds of usage, and then you've got to wait 10, uh, 10 minutes again. So, have you ever seen anybody use a winch within that uh, and meet that criteria? I haven't. And, and, and personally, I haven't. I mean, I, it, there's no way that can apply to the bigger winches. You know, the old Warn 8274s and stuff. You know, I mean, man, you, you would use the winch till you got out, and then you'd carry on. Uh, pretty inconvenient to have to keep stopping every 10 seconds. And here in New Zealand, a lot of those ATVs and ROVs are used by farmers. And in recent years, manufacturers have been supplying uh, more and more of their models with a factory fitted winch. Unfortunately, there is no possibility, no hope in hell that a farmer is going to only use the winch for 10 seconds and then wait 10 minutes. He's got a job to do. He's just not going to do that. So for that particular application, realistically, the vehicle should have been fitted with a much larger winch where it's well under its capacity most of the time, and then you can use it for longer. Um, the rule we used to use at the off-road centre when I was teaching how to use winches and stuff is as soon as the winch motor gets too hot to keep your hand on the motor, so you can put your hand in there and just gently feel the heat. If it's too hot to keep your hand on, then the motor needs to cool down. Simple as that. 
Um, you know, it was a pretty easy rule. Uh, but, you know, obviously they're making winches now as small and as light and as cheap as they possibly can with as high a rating as possible. Uh, and that's what's brought in this really low duty cycle, uh, as we call it. Um, now then, Simon, that winch is as much used as a chocolate fire guard. Yes, and you can see why so many winches fail, because they get burnt out. They're just not up to the job. Uh, Pete Woodfine, I have sent, I have sent Winchester smoking and pouring water on it to cool it down. I have sent Winchester. I think that might be a, 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 a obviously a winch, right? Uh, yes, you put so you put water on a winch to try and cool it down. Is that a good idea? Well, maybe you know. Uh, there was a guy, I forgot his name. He had a 18274 on the front of his G Wagon. I think it was a black one. He, yes, it was. He, he used to own a chain of TV companies and uh, he did winch competitions. And he, he was a very clever chap, an engineer. He designed a water jacket to go around the winch motor. Very impressive. Because on the 18274s, the winch motor's up top. And then there's a gearbox that runs down to the drum. So it's really accessible. And he built this water jacket around it and he cooled it with the engine's coolant. Wow. And it allowed him to use the winch for a lot longer before he had to stop. And, you know, when you're in a competition, you, you just got a winch. That's the whole, it's whoever gets over the finish line first or does that particular stage in the shortest time without any penalty points. Um, and it was, it was pretty impressive. It was all machined and everything. It was a very, very tidy job. On Ben's patrol, he has a mechanical driven winch. It's driven from the gearbox. We used it the other day to put his other ute on the big trailer. And it's so quiet. I couldn't get over how quiet it was. Very cool winch. And he can use the different ratios in his gearbox to determine how much pull that he needs and the line speed on the drum as well. And he can give it a rev, and then the drum, the, the, the winch will go faster, you know, it'll rotate quicker on the drum. Uh, very, very usable winch. The only downside is that he has to be in the vehicle to operate the winch. So you are pretty reliant on somebody else being outside the vehicle to make sure that the cable doesn't bunch up on the drum and things, uh, and to give him instructions. Um, and again, that's another problem with, with, co with common ROVs these days. I see it on, on many different brands where now they only have a button on the dash to operate the winch. There's no longer um, a, a, a remote being supplied with the winch that you plug in, um, you know, where the winch is or somewhere near the winch on a socket, you plug it in so you can be stood in front of the vehicle and operate the winch with a button on a, in fact, there's one up in the workshop that I use for the, for the winch up here, um, which I wired in. Um, you don't get that anymore with ROV winches are not often. Um, so the chances of the cable bird caging, as we call it, uh, on the winch drum is really high and you can get into a lot of trouble and it can be very, very difficult to try and spool back out. Sometimes you, you, you're screwed, you know, if it bunches up and you're already stuck, you can't use the vehicle to reverse back and try and uncoil the, the, the tangled up wire. Now, I think it's, I think it's a problem. Be fair i think all winches should have this remote uh you know or you can get remote ones as well ones that use some kind of radio wave or whatever to work uh, and you can buy those aftermarket as well and wire them in with a little receiver and things they're a great idea uh plus there's no cable to get in the way um but there's more to go wrong right it, it may fail and you can't fix that in the field if you've got a you know a remote then you know you can just pull the switch out and just use the two wires to to connect together and you'll get home that's the point you'll make it home but to only have a switch on the dash that's bad that's really bad it's just a problem or an accident waiting to happen in my opinion now where do we get to um bum, 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 bum. john not all with all that tin roofing you have thought of a of a lightning rod oh that's a very good idea actually Yes, it's a huge expanse of, of tin. I think that could be a really good idea. Just put a steel rod into the ground and, and just connect it to the... Uh, yeah, and, oh, maybe have a, a steel rod as the highest point, like on a church, 
uh, and then you know some heavy cable. In fact, I've got some really heavy cable left over, single core as well, which would be perfect for that job, and then run it down to the ground. Hmm, got me thinking now. We will incorporate that into the design, the final finishes of the, uh, and hopefully there'll be, there'll be no, you know, lightning strikes until then. Good idea though, thanks John. Uh, Connor K, long wire on a short duty cycle winch. Uh, that is deceiving, it is. It's setting people up to fail, to be honest, it really is. Um, I remember we used to have, the first winch I bought for the off-road centre, because we didn't have a lot of money, uh, so I couldn't afford to kit out a number of vehicles, and they were only the little Suzuki Jeeps. Uh, I bought a, 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 a handheld winch. It was electric, uh, and it had you know crocodile clips and jumper cables and stuff. Uh, and you would put it onto your tow ball. It had like a like a, a steel. It was all mounted on a steel cradle, which would hook over your tow ball. It was only I think it was a three thousand pound. It was like an X three three thousand pound winch. Uh, it wasn't powerful enough. We had a little snatch bot for it. I have no idea where that went. Um, it, it sort of got you out now and again, but it was no, for where we went, it was nowhere near powerful enough. Um, but that had built into the, the wiring a bimetal strip cutout, a thermal cutout, which was really good. It stopped you overheating the motor. Uh, and that's something else that you could, you could install, you know, on your vehicle to, to help protect the motor. Um, in all honesty, I found it'd be a pain in the ass. But uh, from memory, it, the winch ran for a lot longer than 10 seconds before the thermal cutout cut in. <laughs> Get it? Um, but anyway, so that was a long time. It was a very long time ago. Uh, we must have sold it to somebody because it was no use to me at all. We ended up buying, I think the, the next winch we bought was a, a, hus a Husky. A super winch Husky, it was. It was a red one. Uh, that was pretty good. That was on the front of my, my recovery Suzuki SJ410 which then became a Suzuki SJ470 diesel uh, with a CD17 engine in there that I put in, uh, non-turbo. Uh, and then that came out, oh, sorry, no, before that, that was the last ver version. Before that, we fitted a Suzuki Swift uh, Mark I GTI engine. Now, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. That thing went really well. And a massive rev range, so you didn't have to change gear that often, you know? It was very cool off-road. Very capable, actually. Very capable. Uh, now then. Mike Adams. Hi, all. I'm late as usual. Feels funny as first after you've shaved clean, doesn't... Feels, feels funny after you've shaved clean, doesn't it? Uh, makes a fella feel kind of naked. Yeah. I'm sort of, I, I get used to it, but yeah, the first day or so, it is really weird. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's time for a change. We're going to go a bit clean shaven for a while and then I'll just get bored and then all the fuzz will grow back as it does. Probably a bit more grey, no doubt. But no, it's it's pretty good. Makes, makes, you know, washing your face a lot nicer. You feel a lot fresher afterwards. It's good. Simon, speaking of engine cooling, I'm going to send you a photo of a pipe with a bleed valve in. Guess how much Fiat want for it. Hmm, okay. I wonder if he sent it on, on chat. Let's have a look. Yes, here we go. Right. So, open to the viewers. No Googling. There is the pipe. Okay. Let's see if we can zoom, zoom in. There we are. Look, so it's got the bleed valve in the middle. So, this is obviously for a Fiat vehicle. Uh, hopefully you can't see the part number. No, no, oh, no, I can't really see the part number either. Okay, so you definitely can't see the part number. Have a guess how much that's going to cost. I'm going to go with £80. £80 for a bit of pipe with a bleed valve in from Fiat, including tax uh, VAT in the UK. Thanks, Simon. It's, the, it's, it's almost like the price is right game show, isn't it, this one, this live stream? I think, <clears throat> I think the pie has pinged. We'll go and get it in a minute. Um, Connor K. On the ships, we had a level win, uh, win, winch, uh, le a level wind in the winches. They guided the wire as it spooled on so it wouldn't become a nest. They were great. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. They are very good. 
usually spring loaded uh, on the four wheel drive style winches. You don't really see it much on four wheel drive stuff, but on the Unimog, we had a worn, I do like my worn winches, a worn um, hydraulic winch on the front, powered obviously by the hydraulic pump that ran the three way tipper and all the other bits and pieces on there, which is really cool. Uh, we even had a snow plow from the front. Now that's awesome, isn't it? You know, having your own personal snow plow was great. Uh, and we also made a, a modified um, thing for the front, which would drop down. And you know when tracks wear and you get the two ruts? Well, that would plow out, a bit like a snow plow, it would plow out and break up all the, the mud in the middle of the track and then fold it back into where the ruts were. It was awesome. And I made that. And it's still in England somewhere. Uh, probably gone for scrap by now because nobody else will have a clue what the hell it did. Uh, but it fitted on the same snowplow mounts and everything, used all the hydraulics. You could lift it up and down. It was pretty cool, to be fair. Anyway, the winch on the front of the Unimog did have one of those plates and it was spring loaded. And it did make a big difference uh, to, in keeping the cable uh, nice and, um, you know, nice and, and, and even and, and correctly spooled onto the drum. Uh, we also had a spool valve put at the front of the vehicle, so you could you could uh, you know use the winch stood in front of the vehicle when you were tidying it up, which is obviously what I'm on about with the lance. Very important. Or you could use the winch inside the vehicle, which was also really cool because you might be doing your own self recovery. Uh, not that the Unimog got stuck very often, but it was handy to have, um, and that was really really good. It was a good winch. It was a little bit slow, you know, on the on the line speed, but it was very very powerful. When you double lined it. Man, you know, you, that's a lot of pull. 32,000 pounds of pull. You can get anything out with that, can't you? If you don't get it out in one piece, it's going to come out in two pieces. That was what I used to say to customers. Um, it was that powerful that sometimes if you had a vehicle that had got stuck on a tree stump, be it a Land Rover Discovery or whatever, and say the back axle was hung up on a tree stump, you could just drive up, hook the winch onto the tow bar, lift the back of the vehicle off the ground so that down the axle clear the tree stump and then just pull them back very gently uh, and then they would you know they'd be free and off they go so you didn't actually sort of do a pull recovery it was more of a lift recovery um, and i'm pretty sure that quite a few of the of the off-roading lads that came down when they saw the unimog in action they'd be like i need one of those i need a unimog because it was brilliant. It was not much longer than a, a Land Rover 110, probably about the same length, um, a lot higher, hell of a lot more clearance and huge tyres. And you had obviously air operated diff locks, portal axles, all that kind of stuff. And 16 gears, forwards and reverse, double clutch, so two plates in the clutch. Um, it had torque tubes, so all your prop shafts were protected. Yeah. I, I miss my Unimog. I'm going to have another one one day. It's on the wish list. It's going to keep saving up. Viewers keep sending me, sending me um, adverts for Unimogs for sale here in New Zealand. And it's like, oh, I can't afford one at the moment. I've bought other stuff, you know. Uh, get the chimney paid off. That's another couple of years to go on there. Trevor the Tractor's got about another year, about another 18 months to go on. Then he's paid. That was the biggest, the most expensive single vehicle I've ever bought was Trevor the Tractor, um, but incredibly useful, so I'm very pleased that I did. Anyway, uh, has the pie dinged yet? Yes, let's go get the pie. Turn around, three, two, one, boom! I'm getting hungry, and we're probably running out of time because Andy likes to waffle lots. Even when he's got nothing to talk about, he still waffles, doesn't he? Okay, there's the pie. It must have pinged quite a while ago, actually, to be fair. Okay, uh, we will just borrow that because we need a clean surface for the pie. Okay, turn around, three, two, one, boom. Okay, so. Oh, the pie, post heating. Boom, 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 there is the lid, looking pretty, pretty tidy. No thermal expansion or cracking, or cracking caused by thermal expansion, should I say, because the pie is definitely bigger now than it went before it went in. Um, that's pretty good, actually. Pretty good indeed. Okay, so I'm going in because I'm bloody starving. First bite. Nom, nom, nom. Oh, it's in focus today. Look at that. Pretty good. Okay, uh, where do we get down? Mike Adams, has anyone figured out 
a way to override that winch system to set up a remote for the option to use it on the uh, at the dash or remote control, depending on your situation. Very, very simple. Uh, on most winches, there's only three wires. Um, depends on the wired up, so you've got to check it. Um, there's a common, which will either be permanent live or permanent round. And then you've got um, the spool in wire and the spool out wire, and they go to the, to the contactor block or the relays. So you can just piggyback off that and put another switch somewhere, or you can put a socket with a plug and a cable and a, a remote handheld. Very, very simple to install. Uh, usually only three wires. Although saying that, Warren did bring out a winch and it was one of the 18274s, and they may have done it on other ones as well, where they used five wires for the relay control, not three. And that was just dumb, but I don't know why they did it. Um, so you've got to work out the switching of those five wires. I think one was still common, but I honestly can't remember. You'll have to Google a wiring diagram probably. If you've only got three wires, it's dead easy. Um, just work out which one is permanent live or permanent ground. Uh, and if you look at the contactor block, you can follow the wires back. It's it's not a hard thing to do, and you can you can put a socket anywhere you want. You know, I used to put them in the grill, and some some of the older one winches used to have the contactor block mounted off the winch motor, like on the eight two seven fours, and the winch on the unit uh, on the fun bus actually on the patrol we have here, my patrol, that's got a twelve thousand pound winch up. No, that's a sixteen thousand pound winch. It's a very big winch for a four-wheel drive um it's a good winch bloody expensive and the contactor block um is mounted with the winch and it has a plug for the lance that's got a lance there's no switch inside the cab for that uh, we used to just plug it in and then run the cable over the bonnet and wrap it around the the the, uh, the door mirror a couple of times and then you could use it inside the cab you know there was no need for a separate winch on the dash a uh, separate switch on the dash Although in my recovery vehicle, I used the off-road site, the first one that I built, I did put a second switch on the dash as well, uh, which was helpful sometimes. Just saved having that cable kicking around. Winches. All sorts of information about winches. It's good. Uh, Mike Adams. When you're going through a Fiat dealer for that part, it might be £80, uh, £80, 80 pounds with a big markup from the dealership making it around 120. That'll be my luck anyway. Simon, hey, 76 quid plus VAT for that pipe and the bleed valve is plastic too. I wasn't too far off. What's that? 76 times 15%. Is, is VAT still 15%? Oh, it was, wasn't it 17.5 over there, wasn't it? Hang on then. 76 times 1.175. Oh, geez, that's not right. 76 times 1.175. 90 quid, including tax. I said 80, so I was 10 pounds out. Yeah, it's not too bad. Hot, oh, quite hot. Okay, there you go. So I better start scoring, I think. That's still pretty expensive what it is, Simon, to be fair, for one bit of pipe. John Nuttall, can you get can you get bad land winches in New Zealand? That's the one Matt's off-road recovery uses. I've not seen bad land winches here. Simon Roll, 20% VAT now. Holy crap, it's gone up. When did it go up, Simon? That's horrific. Right, uh, taste stroke flavor for the contents of the pie. This is not the pastry. It's all right, actually. Ben likes these pies. He likes them a lot. I'm going to give it... Oh, the cheese is nice. And that's included in the contents. So, I'm going to give it... I'm going to give it an eight. Now, that might go up or down, depending on what we get for the rest of the pie. Hmm. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. Okay. Structure Foley Partners. This pie is pretty damn good. It's a little bit soft on the base, just there. I felt my thumb just, just go into it. 
a little bit under its own weight. But saying that, it stayed absolutely perfect. So I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a 10. I think it's done very, very well. There's been, there was no, no indication of any cracks before or after heating. And it's staying together pretty well. It's definitely a one-handed pie, which is nice. Okay. Runnability test. 45 degrees, 30 seconds. Let's see what falls out. Uh, I'll try and catch it. I can't. I don't want to waste any pie. Okay. That is a good 45 degrees. There you go. Pretty accurate, right? And can you see any movement? I'll do that. You can see my arm behind you. You get a good, good background. It's pretty solid, isn't it? Even despite there's quite a bit of cheese coming up. Oh, we've got a little bit just there. Look. Whoa, okay. Was that 30 seconds? Probably a little bit under 30 seconds. Mmm. Hot cheese definitely acts as a lubricant. There's no doubt about that. Okay, so not that kind of lubricant. Come on. Um, runnability. I'll give it a nine. I think that was really good. Quite a safe bet if you happen to be find yourself driving and eating a pie at the same time. Not that you would, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Meat quality. Well, it's not bad. It's not premium steak. I mean, come on, it's only a dad's pie, but it's still not bad. And it doesn't have that sort of stewing steak flavor that some of the cheaper pies have. And there's been no gristle so far. And that's definitely a, something that seems to be happening more and more in pies around New Zealand at the moment, is they're going for cheaper cuts of meat. Wow. Okay, so meat quality. I'm going to give it an 8. We know we can get better. But it's not bad. If we get a lumber gristle, that, that'll come down. Uh, or an odd tasting bit, which is probably part of the cow that we shouldn't be eating, to be fair. Mm. All the cheese is in one corner. So if you want cheese, you go to that bit. Nice though. Okay, pie to crust ratio. Let me just get rid of this bit. Cheese is pretty hot. Okay. So the contents depth is quite, it's not great. We've seen a lot better than that on pies. I'll just lift the lid up a bit for you. There you go. But it's sort of acceptable. We've seen a lot worse. We've seen some really bad pies over the years. Um, so, contents volume to pastry volume. Well, the base is very, very thin. The lid is about five mil at the thickest point. And over here, we've got a big chunk of pastry. But on this side, it's not so bad. We haven't got that big lump, you know, where the, where the lid joins. So there is, you know, actually quite a bit of filling percentage wise versus the pastry. It's actually not bad at all. Okay. So I'm going to give it. Can't get full marks, obviously. Um, but it is pretty good, actually. It doesn't, it's not a pie that tastes of loads of pastry, which is a good thing. Uh, I'm going to give it another eight. I think it's pretty good, actually. This pie is doing pretty well. Now, availability stroke logistics. This pie that came in a box of three came from a countdown supermarket, I believe. This one was in Auckland. Ben picked them up on his way down before he set off down to the cottage last time around. There's a lot of countdowns in New Zealand. If you can get it from countdown, you can buy it online. Obviously, you can't eat it straight away. These were in the free in the freezer or maybe a fridge up there but there's a lot of countdowns and they're delivered to your door which is very convenient um but it's not a kind of pie that's going to satisfy that instant hunger if you're on a road trip it doesn't count for that and i'm treating this as the multi-box i'm not considering the steak and cheese dad's pie that you can buy as a single pie from a dairy that's one we've already scored 
And to be fair, they're always a bit different to the ones you get in multi-packs. So, what do I give it? It can be delivered to your door and you can get it at any countdown supermarket across the country. Now known as Woolworths, because they've done a name change. A bit weird, but anyway. Um, but it doesn't satisfy instant hunger, i.e. road trip. Hmm. Seven? Six? Seven. Let's give it a seven. I think seven's fair. Okay. Pastry taste rating. Well, just so it happens, there's a big chunk of pastry just here. So, it's just, that was just pastry. There was no flavoring to it other than just pastry flavor. It's just bland um, pastry. Nothing special, nothing to write home about. Um, let's give it, it doesn't taste soggy and it's not over hard. It's not crunchy or brittle. It's actually really good. For a pastry flavor, it's really good. So I'm gonna give them a six. No, a seven. It's actually pretty good. We'll give them a seven. If they added a little bit of, you see, the problem is once you start adding additional flavoring, like we've seen with the Wild Bean Cafe steak and cheeses, that flavoring isn't to everybody's taste. And all of a sudden you alienate some of your original customer base, like me. I, I'm not too keen on them anymore. Um, so maybe Dad's Pies are just playing it safe, you know? Okay. Still tasty when cold. Well, I think it wouldn't be too bad cold. If I found this in my glove box and it had been in there for maybe no more than three or four days, then I would probably eat it. I would definitely eat it. And it would do the trick. I mean, obviously it's nice and warm, but it's still okay cold. And as the pie is cooling down now, it's not making it any worse to eat. If it was a vegetable type chicken and vegetable pie or a, something with mushrooms in, um, you know, I can only eat those hot. I can't eat them when they're cold. I just make you gip, to be honest. Hmm. Okay, so I think it would be. Let's give it an eight. Uh, packaging design. Well, the pie itself comes in a clear wrapper, but you can't see this because it's inside the box. But the wrapper is perforated, so it could be put in a pie warmer and it, would, uh, it wouldn't sweat, you know, it would let the moisture out, which is good to steam. Um, the box itself, well, I think it's pretty, there's a lot of information to put on there. Obviously, they've got a lot of space to put information. It's all in big text, even I can read it, which is great. Uh, gives you some heating instructions. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's not bad. Somebody spent a little bit of time putting that together. It's pretty basic. Uh, there's no little window to see the pies inside the box. Um, I wouldn't want to be seen opening the box in a supermarket. You probably get, you probably think you're putting some kind of nasty stuff in there. Um, made in New Zealand. It's all very clear. It's easy to read, and it's clear, and it's not. It's not pompous, you know. It's not over the top. It, you know, it's just a pie at the end of the day. So I think they've done a pretty good job with that. I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them an eight. I mean, the box, you know, it's made of cardboard, which is nice. I'll give them an eight for that. Um, recyclable score. Well, this bit isn't recyclable and this bit is. So they can't get full marks because of the, the plastic bag, which they have to have, obviously. Although nowadays, we will be careful, because nowadays, a lot of sort of plasticky appearance stuff can be made from plants, can't it? And it is degradable. Do they tell us? Because they could tell us. There's lots of space available on the box to say, hey, you can put them in the landfill and they'll just degrade. No, there is no mention whatsoever about what to do with the packaging. So we'll assume it's rubbish. It can't be recycled. So I'm going to knock a couple of marks off for that, so they get eight for the recyclable score. Um, post pie heartburn. Well, nothing yet, actually. And there's not much of the pie left. It's going down a treat. It's tasty, actually. 
Um, so at the moment, it's 10. There's been no burps, no nothing. Obviously, if that changes the score, uh, I'll bring the score down. Okay, Pi server attractiveness. Now, this is Takapuna in Auckland, where the countdown is based, um, which is quite an affluent area. The houses up there are very expensive. It's normally young ladies that are on the tills. Um, it's a while since I've been, to be fair, because now you know, I, I, I don't go to that area much anymore. I used to go there on a regular basis to do our shopping. Um, I was trying to think back as to what it was like then. Yeah. I mean, they were always very helpful. Never had any problems there. In fact, if, if there was, they'd soon sort it out and they were you know, very proactive. Felt very welcome in that store. I'll, I mean, the staff were well presented in general. I'll give them a, I'll give them a six. Yes, I'll give them a six. Okay. Ben goes there on a regular basis, and if the shop wasn't a very nice shop to go to, he wouldn't go there. Ben has high standards. Other than his, his diet. Ben has very low standards with his diet. He eats all sorts of shit. Okay, the last one is stuffability score. So I've got to eat the rest of the pie. Here we go. Three, two, one. Mmm. It's pretty good. This is pretty good. Right, I've forgotten. Uh, oh, stuffability score. So am I stuffed? It did the trick. What's the weight? Three times, so it's 200 gram pie. A standard weight for a New Zealand pie. Yeah, I feel pretty stuffed. I feel okay. It's hit the nail on the head. I don't, I'm not still hungry. I've got beams to lift up, so I best not eat anything else. Um, and I don't feel overstuffed. So, 10 out of 10. Well done. Dad's pies. It'll be interesting to see what score the individual dad's pie got. Because this one, by the looks of it, has done pretty well. Okay, I'm going to turn you around. Let's go and get one of those magnetic strips because I forgot this morning. Three, two, one, boom. Okay. Nope, somebody's having a good rev. That'll fix it. Rev it up. Dipping down, give it a good rev. Oh my word, we're getting low on strips. Let's get, some, let's get some more, won't we? Okay. Turn you around. Boom. Okay, we've got some arithmetic to do. I know it's a Sunday morning, but, you know, it's got to be done. I know, turn you around again. Stupid Andy, got it wrong. Okay. Okay, so what have we got? So we got all 13 scores in. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13 scores in. Oh, here we go. 18, 27, 35, 43, 50, 57, 65, 73, 81, right isn't it yes 81 91 holy crap 91 101 101 at six jeez is that right did i get that right i'm gonna add that up again i've got 107 i don't think we've ever had a score of 107 18 27 <clears throat> 35 43 50, 57, 65, 73, 81, 91, 101, 107. What is going on? 107? We might have a new leader. It, it, honestly, as I was eating the pie, the pie itself didn't come across as being... You know, the best pie in New Zealand. But when you take into account all the other stuff that we do with these reviews, all of a sudden, Dad's pies 
seems to have pulled it out of the hat. I, I really wasn't expecting that at all. So it's a Dad's Pies. Steak and cheese. Oh, and the cheese was really tasty, by the way. It was processed cheese. It wasn't like a nice cheddar in there or anything like that, but it was still pretty good. Okay, Dad's Pies, steak and cheese. Uh, multi, I'll put it in brackets, multi-pack. Times three. Um, but it was pretty tasty. Now, a good pastry. And it got 107. Wow. I can't get over that. I really can't. Okay, let's, let's go and see what happens on the board. Ben's got good taste for pies, hasn't he? Holy moly, I was right. Look, you see Atta's Bar, chicken, bacon, and mushroom, and cheese. Very nice pie. 106. Now, that was a very, very good pie because Atta's Bar make their own pies, so it's only available at that one shop. So they did extremely, so they wouldn't have got many points for that. Um, look at that, though. Dad's Pies. 107. Who would have thought? Right, so Dad's Pies, normal steak and cheese. Oh, there's a Dad's Pies pepper steak, 97. So you see, very tasty again. 97 is a good score. Any more Dad's Pies? Um, 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 um. Dad's pies. Dad's pies pepper steak ninety two. What the hell? We've got two of the same. Dad's pies pepper steak ninety seven. Dad's pies pepper steak ninety two. So it's still pretty much in the ballpark. I mean, obviously the scores are going to vary every time you have one, aren't they? But any more dad's pies? Dad's pies steak and cheese eighty nine. So, believe it or not, the multi-pack pie scored higher, in this case, than the single pie that got 87. I mean, that was a long time ago, okay? So, Dad's pies may have gone, hey, Andy Mechanic reckons we can do this and this and this and we'll get more points. And they've done that. And even in their multi-pack, it came out really, really well. So, well done, Dad's pies. Very impressive. And if you want to sponsor the Andy Buchanan YouTube channel, you're most welcome. You can send some more pies down. Right. I really, really, really wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, and no, Dad's Pies is not a sponsor to the channel. And to be fair, to be fair, I wouldn't be able to take on a pie manufacturer as a sponsor to the channel because then the whole pie review thing would be a little bit tainted, to be fair. You know, my loyalties would probably edge towards the sponsor and it would undermine the integrity of the pie reviews that we do on this channel. And I remain a 100% independent um, I mean, obviously, you know, if, if Tang Tools decided to make pies, I wouldn't be able to, you know, be supported by Tang Tools anymore. If Picoscope started to make pies, you know, Pico Technologies, um, well, I wouldn't be able to use Picoscope anymore. Or, you know, uh, it would be bad. So, luckily, they don't. And I'll talk to Brandon to make sure that they don't. Right. A lighter. Now, it is due to rain today a lot. It rained all day yesterday. Luckily, we had enough jobs to get done in the workshop where we didn't have to go outside. Um, but today, we have to get those beams up and bolted into place. It shouldn't take too long, but we need to get it done uh, before the rains come. It is forecast rain for most of today. At the moment, I can see that the sun is still out, which is nice. Um, so I haven't got forever. We're an hour and 14 in now, so, you know, probably rest of this cigarette and we'll call it a day to be fair um now then what have we got many 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 comments let me get back uh just 
Jeez. No, I don't want to switch to tablet mode. Stupid laptop. Okay. Um, Simon, 20% VAT. Yes, I can't believe that. 2011 that came out. That was shortly, wasn't it, a year or so after we, I left the UK. So, wow, dodge that bullet. Uh, Andrew Wyatt, eating a pie without Henderson's relish should be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Andrew, are you um, linked to the Henderson's Relish Company by any chance? Just a little little uh, slide in there on the comms. Very good. I'll have to try some of Henderson's Relish. Uh, Harry Darg looks good. It was pretty good, actually. Uh, Simon, wild bean in the UK do bacon and cheese turnovers. Mm. Now, actually, Simon, here in New Zealand, they've started to do a bacon and cheese swirl which is sort of pastry based uh it's a bit greasy but it tastes really nice i can, i have one every now and again they're quite expensive they're not much cheaper than a pie and they're about a third the volume to a pie so they're not really ideal for satisfying hunger but they do taste very nice but i could never have two they're that kind of thing where you once you've had one you go yes yeah, enough you know in fact even halfway through you're going Got to finish it, you know. To me, to me at least, it's just a little bit too rich. Um, right, Wade Mayer, <clears throat> howdy for the American Midwest. The kiddo and I are listening in while we tear down old, an old data center power strips for recycling. Wow, good on you! I did some recycling the other day, and I got what was it? Just under one hundred and fifty New Zealand dollars. And there would have been about, it was a mix of steel and aluminium and bits and pieces. Um, about, probably about 500 kgs all up. Total weight. I know it's difficult. And 400 of that was steel. So 100 kilograms of Ali mix, which is Ali mixed with steel. Uh, there was a little bit of copper in there, a few motors and alternators and stuff that have come off vehicles over the years. So we had, it was all part of our shed tidy up. So they've all gone. Um, however, what I have found for you, which will be on a video, I'm not going to do it on the live stream because I think it'll be wasted. Um, but watch out. I'm going to be doing a video where I've dug out all my old tools that I brought from the UK. And they're in ammo boxes. They're just outside the workshop at the moment, just out, uh, on a pallet. Um, there's five or six ammo boxes full of my old tools from the UK. Uh, now, I have got, I think now, just enough space in the workshop to accommodate those tools. So I'm going to do a video showing you my old tools from the UK. I haven't seen them for probably, well, since 2009 when, we put them in the, when Ben put them in a box or in boxes. So we're now on 2024, so I have no idea what's in those boxes. But I'm sure it's going to bring back lots of memories. So watch out for the video. I'm sure it'll be pretty interesting. Uh, hopefully I'll have that done in the next couple of weeks because I want to get them put away. Although I might have to get Mrs. Mechanic to clean a few of them because, you know, they're probably a little bit of rust is setting, unfortunately, with them being stored for so long. Um, <clears throat> uh, Andrew, not as disappointing as a Frey Bentos pie then. Uh, no. No, the Frey Bentos pies now, I'm sorry, they're just, I don't even think about them. I don't like them. I don't like the puff pastry. They hardly have any meat in them. Um, they're just massively underwhelming. Um, just not an option for me. And, of course, they come in a big steel tin, which is not great for the environment. So They're a pain in the ass to cook. Not my kind of pie. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of pastry to them, but I, I like a pie with pastry as well, not just meat. You know, if I wanted a tin of meat, I'd just go and buy a tin of meat. Um, the, the, yeah. Nah. Not, not, it wouldn't even entertain one now, to be fair. The real Daz is, here we go, is Atlas Bar finally gone from the top? Yes, Atlas Bar, yes it has. It's now number two. We have finally, well done Dad's Pies again, and it, it wasn't rigged. Please don't think that it was rigged. It wasn't, I had no idea that, that pie was going to rate so high. 
Um, and it's a combination of many factors. It, and the pie itself, and I'll stress this, the pie itself, I have definitely eaten better tasting pies. Don't get me wrong. But when you take into all, the fact, all that criteria and the fact that I can jump online now and order some and they'll be here in a couple of days, uh, you know, I could fill the freezer for them, with them without even leaving the house. That's a major plus these days because, you know, we may go into another lockdown and you need your pies, right? Now then, um, Connor K, I clicked the like at the beginning of the live stream. Good man, thank you. Uh, the screen is only showing one like. Uh, I've got 16 likes at this end, Connor. Um, where do we get to? Uh, YouTube has made changes that we can't see as others have clicked like as well. Oh, well, I'll happily tell you we've got 17 likes now. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, YouTube's changing. I mean, the, the, the whole live stream platform that I use on my phone was completely different this morning. Um, don't know what was going on there. Very strange. Um, what pie was scoring 109? Uh, I think that was a pork pie, a different league altogether, N not taking into account the same as a hot meat pie or whatever, you know, just different thing altogether. Um, now then, Simon, that pie is a bit of a curveball. It was, wasn't it? I wasn't expecting that at all. Purple Monkey, 1974. Uh, time to remove the duplicate pie keep the highest highest scoring yeah or do we take the average and write out a new label didn't realize we've done that one twice i mean it's going to happen isn't it as we you know i mean i've eaten a lot of pies around new zealand and uh sometimes you forget so yes i'll discuss with mrs mechanic she can make a decision on that i think probably taking the average score is probably the most logical thing to do uh simon pico pies has a ring to it it does doesn't it you should maybe flick them an email and say, Andy Mechanic says you need to make some pies or at least sell, you know, franchise out the Pico name to to the pie industry. No, they shouldn't do that. No, please don't. Do it. I, I really like my Pico. I don't want us to have to stop using it. Uh, and I don't want to stop doing the pie reviews because, you know, it's a Sunday morning breakfast, isn't it? It works well. Uh, Connor K. As Eric from SMA would say, Napa, not a sponsor. Same for pies, Andy. That's right. Pies, not a sponsor. Good call, Connor. Uh, Wade, I used to work for Sims. Ah, I know. I, I know what. Know what to separate out is key. There are five point seven kilowatts, so lots of copper. These are five. Oh, these are five point seven kilowatts. Yes, copper's good. Copper is really good. Yeah, well, you keep up the good work there, Wade. Um, there's plenty of money in scrap, like you say, if you know what you're doing. Uh, Simon, you remember the hairy bikers then? Yes. Dave passed away. I saw a Facebook post on that. Looks like there is going to be a massive ride in his honour. Hopefully a few thousand bikes. I saw the advert for the ride as well. Very cool. And uh, yes, I mean, you know, it's going to happen to all of us eventually. Um, but a terrible loss really is. Oh, that was a burp. What does that mean? Is it joint first now? Andrew Wyatt, uh, Dave Mayers, another legend. Rest in peace. Absolutely. Uh, last one. Uh, Simon, Andrew Wyatt, 8th of June. Don't think the small town he's from will know what hit them. No, they'll be inundated by many, many, many motorcycles, I think. Top look. Right, crew, I think we're about there. The end of the live stream is nigh. Uh, thank you all very much for joining in. Uh, I do appreciate it. It's given my Sunday morning a nice boost. Uh, and now I've got a bit more enthusiasm to start clambering around roofs and doing some more timber work. Um, please hang in there for the future videos. There will be more. I've got lots planned. I just don't physically have the time at the moment to do the filming. Um, I need to just get this shed done for Ben, or at least this next couple of weeks done uh, and then we can crack on we've got the freewheeling hubs to fit to the chimney we've got some winches to look at uh there's another video i can't remember what it is now that's in in the wings as well so there's a few more to come through shortly uh thank you again 
It's Saturday. It's look, I'm in the future. This is Sunday here in New Zealand, okay? It's Sunday morning in New Zealand. Um, Gisborne are the people that get up earliest. Gisborne, New Zealand. They're on the furthest point on the east coast. Sunshine rises ridiculously early over there. Um, so no lies in in Gisborne, unfortunately, unless you've got those nice blanking um, dark curtain things that you can get. Anyway, we digress. Thank you again very much for all your support. I do really appreciate it. Oh, Simon, that was it. It was your um, the code read, the scanner that you sent through. We're going to connect it to the Jimny and see if there's any hidden codes. Uh, and the little monkey bike as well, actually. So there's two more videos there. So that's going to be an action-packed day's filming is that one. Okay, crew. Well, until next time, take care of yourselves. Cheers. Over and out.